everybody and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. Project HR is brought to you by IRI Consultants. IRI empowers leaders to prevent and solve mission-critical workforce issues through holistic and sustainable strategies. For more information, you can visit IRI at iriconsultants.com. I am Jennifer Oroqua, Director of Business Development for IRI and your host for today's episode of Project HR. Now, the Starbucks effect used to be a term that described the positive impact the Starbucks store opening would have on neighboring property values. Today, that phrase might be better used to describe the efforts of Starbucks Workers United. More than 300 stores in close to three dozen states have voted overwhelmingly to form a union in the last year. Today, I'm joined by Franklin Coley, partner at Align Public Strategies, a full-service public affairs and creative firm that helps corporate brands, governments, and nonprofits navigate the outside world and inform their internal decision-making. Franklin is also the co-host of Align's podcast, Working Lunch, and today he'll be helping us take a closer look at the strategies surrounding this newly defined Starbucks effect. Franklin, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, happy to be here. So Franklin, in the last episode of Project HR with IRI consultants Mark Codd, we explored the world of independent unions and the rise of employee-led organizing. So with that as our background, today I want to take a closer look at what's been happening at Starbucks specifically and what employers and HR and labor teams can do. So at the risk of repeating what we already know, let's just set the stage with a quick run through of the timeline and how quickly this can happen to a company. Just a year ago, there were zero unionized Starbucks locations. All this started in two stores in Buffalo in December of last year. What happened next? Well, a lot happened. Um, It's hard to believe that it was less than a year ago. But yeah, if you go to uh, moreperfectunion.us, which is a kind of labor affiliated and back site, Law360 has has a a map as well of all the Starbucks locations. You can get the total count. So over that period, we now have 257 Starbucks stores in 35 states that have won union elections and 336 stores in 38 states that have filed to, you know, go through the process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, massive amounts, just unbelievable uh, amount has happened in the past, what, let's see, 10 months, 11 months, something like that. Yeah, Yeah, crazy. Really short period of time. And of course, you know, we we say that, and but the unionized stores make up less than 3% of the 9,000 company operated Starbucks stores. So what kind of an impact has this had? Yeah, that's true. And actually, uh, to put further context around that, there actually are uh, unionized Starbucks locations. They're licensed locations, usually done by institutional food providers and airports or uh, on university campuses, that sort of thing. So um, it's, you know, Starbucks has had experience with unions. In fact, early on, um, some of the Seattle stores were unionized by the UFCW. But uh, yes, you know, they, they, it still overall is a small percentage uh, writ large of the entire system. You know, the question is, what's that kind of tipping point where they start to gain enough leverage to really force outcomes from the brand? And I know we'll spend some time talking about that today. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what that magic number is. I don't think Starbucks does. I don't think the union does. I don't think we're there yet. But, um, you know, heck, you had said a year ago that, you know, Starbucks is going to have around 300 unions unionized. Someone would have said you're crazy. Yeah, um, for sure. And so certainly it's changing the issue portfolio of the company, the positioning of the company, the way mm-hmm. the company thinks through and, and strategically plans. And so um, it's already having an impact on the business. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the question is how what that looks like over the, the next year or years is, uh, I think, a big question mark. Yeah, and I think it's particularly notable because prior to these organizing actions, prior to the pandemic, with free, few exceptions, the Starbucks employer brand was as an employer of choice, offering perks and benefits that aren't often available to employees in the quick serve industry. So so what changed? So it it was, it is, and continues to be uh, an employer of choice. Um, and I, you know, a lot of workers have and continue to work at Starbucks because of their benefits package. They offer mm-hmm. a bunch of unique benefits that you can't really find elsewhere in the in, in the entry level and employer space. Um, this primarily is not so much about Starbucks and pay in benefits. I would argue. I think there is something that is happening in the American economy coming out of the camp the pandemic a lot of kind of clashing trend lines 
that all came together within these Starbucks locations and create a, a unique set of circumstances. But this is not just happening within Starbucks. You know, we have a petition at Lowe's and, you know, Trader mm -hmm. Joe's and Apple and, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon, all these other. So, and by the way, all through the, the restaurant industry, we'll probably talk about in the coffee segment and all these groups are affiliating with different unions. So there's something more fundamental happening in the economy with frontline workers. It just happens that Starbucks was kind of uniquely positioned, uniquely exposed and vulnerable to this thing taking off in, in the way it did. So all that is, that's a very long winded way to say that Starbucks is an employer of choice. They're, mm -hmm. they're above you know, the rest of their competitive set in pay and benefits. Mm -hmm. And that has not slowed this, this kind of, this year of, of union organizing. Well, and you mentioned that this, of course, isn't the first time a union has represented Starbucks workers, but it's this is the first time it's really taken hold. So is this, as you mentioned a second ago, you know, is this something about our economy? Was it the right time, the right place? Or is it something about Starbucks workers united? Are they bringing something to the table that these workers haven't seen before? Probably all of the above. And um, in the context of this question, I think it's helpful to think about the Starbucks campaign in like two different phases. The first okay. phase being the Buffalo campaign and then the greater Boston mm -hmm. campaign, the first two markets to organize mm -hmm. and then the rest being the latter, you know, 300 or whatever. Right. So these first two areas, first off, we had a wave of independent coffee chain organizing going for six months or a year. And prior to that, we had, even before the pandemic, we had a wave of brew pub distillery, Mm -hmm. organizing across the country. So everywhere that it was, you know, okay to have a upturned mustache or, you know, maybe a waistcoat <laughs> be behind the bar, you know, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you're making, you're making a drink as a craft, whether, right. It's, it's kind of a different type of employee. Mm -hmm. It's a different level of skill, but we have a wave of organizing, um, Surly, Goose Island, Anchor, Fair State Brewery, all this. And, and then it kind of moved into the coffee segment we had upstate New York, Gimme Coffee, Spot Coffee. We had Darwin's in uh, in the Boston area, Pavement, mm -hmm. Diesel. So we were saying to our clients, you know, for at least a year that the coffee segment during the pandemic, we were seeing a lot of activity and it was going to jump to a chain. We didn't know which. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know if it was going to be a brew pub chain or a independent coffee chain or both. And those initial campaigns in that uh, Buffalo market and Boston market, Workers United was essentially salting. That's a little bit of a strong word, but salting coffee shops in the entire region mm -hmm. to organize the labor pool in Buffalo. That was their intent. And mm -hmm. this is documented in the press. Mm -hmm. um, Unite Here was doing the same thing in Boston. And Right around the time in, in the Boston campaign, they actually won a contract with Darwin's for $15 an hour, why Starbucks workers were going to essentially vote there. And it just kind of threw gasoline on the effort. So in Unite Here stepped out of the way in Boston and allowed the SEIU to take over. So the SEIU wins in Buffalo, well, or Unite it, Workers United mm. wins in Buffalo mm -hmm. um, at a couple of locations, they lost one. And then, you know, they, they win in 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 Boston, those look like traditional kind of labor organizing efforts we're used to, where like SEIU Justice for Janitors, they go and they organize a metro area, the entire labor pool, and then, you know, they they operate that way. What happened next was a whole new thing. And that's where this thing just spun out and spun off and and took off and just blew up nationally. Mm -hmm. And there were there were a lot of lot of pieces there that we we can kind of talk through what makes their kind of campaign and their organizing uh unique but but those those initial campaigns looked a lot like traditional organizing campaigns everything that came after is is kind of new and, and unique mm -hmm. and so what what's different about their strategy what can we as employers learn from that like you're saying you predicted that this was going to jump to a chain um all well and good but what can we learn from that yeah so you know in those initial markets kind of your your strategy to deal with it would be the same that, you know, the 1994 playbook, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but what happened after that? And 
some will argue that's unique to Starbucks. I, I would argue that it's not totally unique to Starbucks, but there are certainly brands that have more exposure. But what happened after that? We can do a separate podcast on it, but you know the, the, the employee base is different today, right? You know they're digital natives, right? Mm -hmm. They're kind of the Zoom generation, and they're um, they're more progressive. They expect more out of their workplace. Um, they expect that their their workplace, their employer is going to be in involved in changing the world, not just selling coffee, right? You know, mm -hmm. we've seen mm -hmm. this realignment of kind of politics where we're sorted more, where we're connected more in these social networks um, through, you know, Bernie Sanders social network, right? Like you may be connected to workers in another city or, and so all those things kind of came together and um, Workers United had like three organizers managing the Starbucks. I don't know how many they have now, but, you know, six months in, they had three national organizers. Crazy. This was happening like worker to worker, skipping mm -hmm. across the, the country. Mm -hmm. And just, it was all through social networks and it became cool. It became a meme to mm -hmm. organize a Starbucks. And so, you know, how do you deal with that as an employer? You know, that's, that's not easy. That is mm -hmm. really, really difficult. It's going to be different for every brand. You know, some practitioners I will hear talking now and in, in this day and age that you need to be talking about you know, you need to be talking about unions and unionization from the day people start their, their first day of work, right? Mm -hmm. um, others, you know, certainly you you want to do what all employers do and all your listeners do and you do well for all your your clients is you want to be surveying and finding these wedge issues. There mm -hmm. were a lot of wedge issues in the Starbucks campaign that organizers were able to take advantage of mm -hmm. and the brand you know, had some, some blind spots and that, that kind of allowed this thing to take off. Yeah. All right. It's brilliant advice, Franklin. I need to take a quick sponsorship break right now, but when we return, I want to dig into how Starbucks has responded over the last year. Stay with us. Labor relations is changing rapidly and it can be frustrating if the tools you're using are not keeping pace. If you spend too much time searching for what you need, or you find it challenging to collaborate with your team, it's time to think about your employee communication resources in a different way. You need a labor relations platform that will help you connect with and educate employees. Proofbox solves these problems by offering a robust labor relations library of videos, e-learning, and ready-to-use websites at an affordable price. Whether educating employees or supervisors in preventive mode or in the middle of a union organizing campaign, Proofbox is like Netflix for labor relations. Learn more today at bit.ly slash proofbox and make sure your tools are keeping up with the pace of labor relations today. I'm back now with Franklin Coley, partner at Align Public Strategies. I'm Franklin, 80% of the Starbucks stores, around 245 of them who have taken the organizing effort all the way to a vote, have voted to unionize. And I think you said 257. The number kind of changes every here and there. But um, why have these drives have been so apparently sort of effortlessly successful when similar campaigns elsewhere, such as Amazon, have been less successful? Why have the outcomes been different? So ironically, the, the one thing that is traditionally inoculated the, the restaurant industry from union organizing is these small workplaces, right? So a typical mm -hmm. Starbucks location will have 30 workers. Um, whereas a typical Amazon warehouse, I don't know what, 3,000 workers, 4,000 workers, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, grocers, you know, they may be in the 300 range, right? So, um, so traditionally, unions have not fooled around with, you know, 20 person units. It just right. it doesn't make sense to service those contracts. And so that has inoculated kind of the restaurant industry and similarly situated industries, convenience stores, from, from really being targets of organizing efforts. Ironically, in this context, where you have these digital campaigns that are essentially, you know, in some ways leaderless, right? They're like skipping across through social networks. The smaller unit makes it easier for those campaigns to take off like wildfire because these elections, you could go through and run the average. I bet you the average election in these Starbucks units is like eight to 11 votes. So some of these are being won with three votes in favor of the union. So, you know, it's not that hard to get seven people out of 30 
to support a union when it's kind of the cool thing to do and everybody on social media is doing it. And there's these other dynamics in play, right? You can walk across the street and get another job at more pay tomorrow if, you know, if this doesn't shake out, right? So um, that is not the case in an Amazon warehouse. The Amazon warehouse, even if all the atmospherics are the same, workers have all this angst coming out of the pandemic and, you know, you still have to go through a, a, a grinding kind of organizing campaign just because of the vote numbers. And so, it, you know, everyone kind of falls in between in that spectrum, right? Like a Trader Joe's, maybe arguably closer to, to Starbucks and an Amazon warehouse, but you still have to have kind of an own the ground organizing effort, probably with that that traditional mix that that unions like, which is the seasoned organizer that can get kind of steer things. And then the, the young, hungry, mm-hmm. you know, um, idealist that, you know, are ready to run, run off the cliff, right? You, mm-hmm. you want kind of that, that, that combination in a workplace to run an effective, if you're a union, to run an effective organizing campaign. You need a lot more of that to win in Amazon. In Starbucks, in a, in a small unit that, you know, three people decide next week out of nowhere because they saw something on social media, they're going to file an election petition they may have to only convince two other people to, to win that election. Right, so right. that's that that's like one of the big fundamental differences between, in my mind, between Starbucks and some of these other organizing efforts. There's obviously a difference between the Starbucks worker and the Starbucks mm-hmm. culture than mm-hmm. there are with other brands. And that certainly plays into that. That's we that's another podcast. We can dig right. into that too. But we're gonna um, have to have you back. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think those those fundamentals. I, I think of the reason why this thing just just blew up and took off like kind of grass fire. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Now, there's a, a recent NPR article where organizers called Starbucks response a, a scorched earth campaign to crush the union. You know, and there have been 325 ULPs filed against Starbucks in the last 11 months. Certainly, they're keeping the legal team busy. What do you think of Starbucks response to all of this? I think Starbucks early on. First off, I would encourage everyone to go check out Washington Post podcast posted in the past couple of weeks. It was um, an, an Washington Post reporter got embedded with Howard Schultz for a number of months while he traveled the country mm-hmm. and and um, went on essentially a five month listening tour and helped to craft the response. It's a fascinating podcast. Um, I think it's pretty fair and it, I think it gives some real insight. I think um, I think they really messed up in um in the early markets buffalo and boston and i think they allowed this thing to kind of get out and mm-hmm. once it had so much momentum um it was hard to stop and so there's a couple ways to to break this down operationally you know howard schultz five month kind of listening tour they've identified a number of things that they're they're making changes to right mm-hmm. and I, I think we can't ignore that right um mm-hmm. Scheduling's a big one. It's a big one for everyone coming out of the pandemic. A lot of frontline workers got jerked around and a lot of it wasn't operators' fault, right? Because mm-hmm. there were shutdowns mm-hmm. and there were and, and that communication didn't always make it through to the frontline worker, right? Mm-hmm. But they're scheduling the the Starbucks algorithm apparently um, could give you 15 hours one week and then 30 the next week. And so there's some issues there. They've, you know, they've doing some operational changes with the ice makers and and some other things. So there's a lot of operational stuff they've they've been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, Starbucks messaging, particularly in those early markets, I think was disconnected. And mm-hmm. and to say to say it one way, so they they in those early markets and throughout the campaign have had frontline managers crossing over to essentially join union organizers and, mm-hmm. and union members. I mean, frontline managers is your team knows and, and your client, that's your your first kind of line of defense. Um, and if you have them crossing over, you have some fundamental issues in terms of, you know, labor relations. And mm-hmm. I think that goes back to uh, the Starbucks brand. I, you know, Howard Schultz, and it, it really comes through in that Washington Post interview um, or podcast, and you saw it in his presidential campaign and he is, it's hard to separate Starbucks from Howard Schultz. And, it, you know, he's, it's like a private company in a way and not like a mature kind of public company. Like he, so much of his imprint is in the company, but he mm-hmm. sees this lane in America, this progressive lane that is kind of pro-business. And you saw that in his presidential campaign or short-lived 
exploratory committee. And that lane, I don't know if it exists anymore. It's certainly very narrow, right? So, you know, it, and I think, I think that is an internal and external messaging challenge for them to, that they're going to continue to grapple with. The last thing I would point to, and we could talk about this forever too, but the last thing I would point to is those first elections. I mean, the SEIU was never talked about, you know, mm. workers, workers United, you know, it, it, it had, it was an affiliate of an affiliate, right? It, it, it was not, it was not McDonald's that the SEIU has been executing the fat fight for 15 campaign against for the past, you know, 10 plus years or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the SEIU was there. They were part of it. Clearly, these original locations, particularly in Buffalo, um, were, were salted, right? So that never came out. This It was the narrative that grabbed hold nationally and even in the local media, and I suspect in the ground, was that this was a grassroots um, worker thing. And there was obviously an element to that in the early locations, but there were obviously organizers that went in early into into these locations. Now, mm-hmm. subsequently, once you get out of Boston and start going nationally, I think it's it's hard to argue that a lot of that is not just kind of grassroots. It, you know, mm-hmm. it's it really took on a grassroots feel in the latter half. But what kicked it off, and and so none of that messaging really came out and came through early on. And I think if it had, I don't know if it would have changed the outcome, but it would have definitely changed the national narrative in my mind. And mm-hmm. I, I think that was a missed opportunity uh, as well. But um, look, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's easy right. to look at all these converging trend lines um, in, in hindsight. And in the midst of it, I think Starbucks was super worried about protecting its progressive brand while trying to, do, you know, um, prevent... The, these locations from going, you know, mm-hmm. union. And, and I think that was a real, a real challenge. And I think they did not get the right mix and, re, and the approach right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really good insight. I want to kind of look ahead, though, to the future. So, you know, some of the reports said that Workers United had been kind of hands off during organizing. And, and while collective bargaining really just began at a handful of stores in October, do we know how involved they've become in the collective bargaining process? Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I obviously they're involved. Um, they just held the initial meetings. Those were organized. They were there were worker representatives, but you have union organ union professional organizers have to come in to be a part of these negotiations. There's mm. just no way it's going to get done otherwise. And you know, the key thing here that y'all know, and you know, is that they're going to have to take all these thousands of concerns, complaints that have been voiced in all these locations and roll them up into a series of, you know, five or 10 bullet pointed demands that everyone is on board with. And so mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, Workers United is, you know, the dog that caught the car, right? They, they right. never plan they never <laughs> right. yeah. to run a national Starbucks campaign. And now they have all these units that they've got to kind of get on the same page mm-hmm. to compress some you know, some bullet pointed kind of bargaining items. And I think what they're going to settle on, and you're starting to see this already, are, you know, a lot of this stuff is around rights in the workplace and, you know, kind of these protections from firing, some of the scheduling stuff I mentioned earlier, a voice in the process. They're working in the wage and benefits, but that never really was the core of all of this anyway. So I, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of other stuff. And I think they will have seasoned negotiators um, steering this process. Yeah. Well, and I have read something previously that said that there was a committee of about 50 Starbucks employees who had been meeting weekly to discuss strategy for weeks. You know, I'm just not sure that those people are ready for the realities of what collective bargaining actually is. Well, you saw that, uh, you, you probably saw that the the first day of bargaining, um, Starbucks walked away from the table 30 mm-hmm. seconds and then yep. not yep. to return. So th- those are the types of right. those are the types of episodes that demonstrate that you better have you know some seasoned folks to uh, yeah. if you're going to yeah. make any progress whatsoever. For sure, and and one store is actually already attempting a decertification, and there have some, been some work stoppages too. Is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, there's been wildcat strikes throughout um, mm-hmm. different different locations. Their their only big national day of action thus far was Labor Day, um, where they held sip-ins at uh, locations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a very soft kind of 
I would argue, test run for upcoming national days of action where they try to shut down locations. And as we get deeper into the bargaining process, it'll get uglier, obviously. So we have not had those yet, but I fully expect as negotiations start to, you know, peter out that we're going to see more and more aggressive in-store actions. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, it's time for another quick break. Franklin, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and my guest today is Franklin Coley, partner at Align Public Strategies. We're back. All right. So, Franklin, there does seem to be some slowdown in the rate of organizing at Starbucks. Why do you think that is? How should Starbucks take advantage of this time? Yeah. So, first off, you know, they they took advantage of the low-hanging fruit right out of the gate, right? So, mm-hmm. the, the, the locations that were packed full of, you know, Bernie Sanders supporters or, you know, super union-friendly workers, those are obviously the ones that picked up on this end line pretty quickly and, and mm-hmm. jumped in. So, there was always going to be kind of a a fall off. That was inevitable. I would argue, regardless of what, you know, how aggressive, you know, Starbucks strategy, how they approached this. um, I think there was always going to be some fall off at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I do think some of Starbucks actions, we talked earlier about, you know, probably some missteps early on. Um, I think Starbucks has gotten um, more, more sophisticated and better um, at responding. It will be interesting and I think that also has um, has slowed things down. Um, I, I do I do think that it will be interesting to see how the NLRB treats the way that the company has responded, and if that kind of blows back on the company. Or it, so I think that's unclear. You know, uh, the NLRB has uh, taken action against Schultz and um, uh, the CEO of Amazon as well, and kind of comments they have made to workers just this past week or so. So, and we've seen reinstatements and other things. Um, So, you know, I I think Starbucks actions have stemmed the tide. And Mm -hmm. now we're into this slog period where the units are going to come much more slowly. And now the union is going to have to demonstrate some ROI. They're going to have to post some wins if they want to keep the momentum going. And of course, the company, I suspect, is going to want to do just the opposite and start the decertification process once we hit the year threshold. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of where we are now. Yeah, for sure. So so big picture, what do you think this new model means for us as employers? You know, if we're facing future organizing attempts, obviously they have figured something out here that they didn't have in their back pocket before. So what does that mean for us? Yeah, and everyone's obviously trying to bottle the lightning right now, um, yeah. and I don't know how much transferability there there is. Um, but I do think that when this started, they this was not intended to be this proving ground for the modern labor movement. But in, in a lot of ways, I think it has become that. And mm-hmm. so I do think that if this peters out and does not take hold, I think, you know, contract unionism is in a very, very bad spot. Um, and I, if it does, if they are able to, earn concessions and make this work, and they are able to bundle up some of these tactics, I think it'll breathe new life. And the labor movement, of course, the NLRB and others are are working to to make that easier uh, about every day. I think employers need to be thinking about, you know, there's a lot of, I'm going to throw a lot of different thoughts at you all that weren't like much further discussion. But there's there's a SHRM study a week or two ago um, that showed that workplaces are more divided than ever mm-hmm. along partisan lines. And um, you see that in the sorting. I mean, there used to be pro-labor Republicans and there used to be uh, pro-business Democrats. You see less and less of that. And so you also see increasingly brands that are marketing in this way as well. Y- you know, you think about Black Rifle Company as compared to Starbucks, or you think about Hobby Lobby that, you know, Mm -hmm. CEO and president just is, you know, giving his company over to the church, essentially, or Patagonia, the CEO is going to give his company over way to environmental causes. So Mm -hmm. there's this wrapping, there's this wrapping up of brands that are leaning into um, kind of, I don't want to say ideology that's a little bit strong, but leaning into these cultural issues and cultural identities. And at the same time, workers are expecting these cultural issues and identities to be represented in their workplaces. 
and they're increasingly connected online. And, you know, we we're talking about Zoomers earlier and how they're digital natives. They also mm -hmm. do not delineate like I do, you know, and, and I think older generations do between work life and home life right, and right. sports. And there's no delineation. Like for me, mm -hmm. I go to work and, you know, you, you don't talk about religion or in work or politics right. at the Thanksgiving right. table, right? Yeah. People don't, that's not how, that's not how people roll these days, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. young people, their online identities cross all of those silos simultaneously and their expectations do as well. And so that is fraught for companies that just want to sell a chicken sandwich or, <laughs> you know, a pair of sneakers. Right. That, that is a fraught environment to navigate. And so mm -hmm. I think the Starbucks campaign illustrates how that can get away from you very quickly. Um, and I think that is the challenge in this environment on a moving forward basis. And it's going to be different for every brand because your public positioning and, and how you market yourself to consumers and how you attract and retain workers, that culture is different from brand to brand. But all these issues are like pushing down into your workplace now. And you have mm -hmm. got to have, you have got to be aligned um, through all kind of the silos of your company and thinking through those things in a very kind of strategic and, and, and thoughtful way. And uh, it's just it's just a more difficult environment for employers to operate in. Mm -hmm, for sure. And you had mentioned earlier about how it, it became cool to be part of this this movement at Starbucks. And even though Starbucks was was and is truly an employer of choice, you know, it's it's hard to get around your head around. Well, why are you why are you doing this? Why are you organizing? And I think you hit the nail on the head where you talked about, you know, it's part of their identity. It's not just the company they work for. It's them. And they want their values aligned with the company that they work for and vice versa. So really interesting and difficult times for employers, for sure. And the last thing I'd say, just to kind of close it out, Starbucks has spent decades attracting those workers, pulling mm -hmm. them in, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. their definition of, you know, progressive and thoughts around progressive over that time have kind of morphed and changed. Starbucks has built a workforce that was really kind of custom made for organizers to come in and, and organize. Um, and th that's because that the type of worker and the type of way that the brand has positioned has has just the society has kind of drifted that way. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, super interesting. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm glad to come back anytime you want to you want to chat more. Outstanding. Yeah. And we've mentioned your employer aligned public strategies several times. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how, how you can help companies facing this kind of situation? Yeah, we're we're often looking at all these external events and, um, you know, in the political space um, and in particular and and helping companies take the external world back inside and kind of think through their their positioning. And mm -hmm. so, you know, relative to this conversation, obviously, labor relations is happening within the four walls. But a lot of this stuff, as we just talked about, mm -hmm. is, is happening outside the four walls. And you need smart people on, on both sides to make sure that uh, everything's aligned. So that's that's what we help companies do, kind of think through that. Very nice. I also wanted to ask you about Align's podcast, Working Lunch. I know you have your Starbucks Watch segment on Working Lunch, and you've recently talked about Chipotle, even Target. What other topics do you cover? Yeah, um, all, all that um, on a weekly basis uh, and, you know, get into a lot of labor policy. So our, our little niche is kind of the entry level employer space. So mm -hmm. uh, C-store, hotel, restaurant, retail. And so the commonality across those business models are usually, you know, labor cost. And, and so labor mm -hmm. policy is not the only thing we talk about. We talk about a a lot of different issues that impact entry level employers, but labor policy and seems to take up a lot of the conversation at, at least lately. So um, it's all those sort of external pushes and pulls uh, that the entry level employer space is, is facing. Very nice. So if our listeners want to find out more about you, about Align Public Strategies or your podcast, where should we go? Well, you can go to, to most of your um, your, your major podcast platforms, iTunes or whatever else, but um, mm -hmm. Restaurant Business, which is a trade pub for the restaurant industry, kind of host our Working Lunch podcast. So you can go to their website and uh, and find us as well. And you can also hit just the Align Public Strategies uh, website and, and look us up there as well. 
And of course, all the things that Franklin mentioned will be linked up in this week's episode companion, which you can grab for free at iriconsultants.com slash podcast. Right now, though, Franklin, it is time for our lightning round questions. These are questions I ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you ready? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. All right. So our first question is always a topic showdown. And in this episode, we've been talking about the new Starbucks effect. Franklin, which Starbucks drink are you more likely to order, an iced frappuccino or a hot latte? I'm so boring. I I, I would go with the, the drip coffee, the Pikes Peak. But I, <laughs> definitely, definitely a hot over a cold. I, yeah. don't do, I don't do the ice. So if, yeah. if my only two options are those, it'd be a hot latte. All right. Well, I drink a dirty chai, so we're all good. <laughs> Get that espresso shot in there. All right. Next question. What is the best book you've read recently? So I haven't, I've just started reading this, but this is, this is for the benefit of our previous topic. Secrets of a Successful Organizer, available at Labor Notes. And this is one of the, this is kind of the Bible of the Starbucks organizers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it is it's fairly short and, you know, it has a bunch of case studies, so you can, you can jam it out quickly. But I'm only like 30 pages into it. All right. We'll go check it out. All right. What is your favorite thing about the work that you do? Uh, probably, you know, this just kind of uh, strategically thinking through things and, and looking for those um, win-wins. So, yeah, I truly believe that the, you know, brands that are smart about this stuff, there's, there's a win-win spot um, mm -hmm. always and trying to find those, those win-win spots for companies is, uh, it's what I enjoy. All right. Very good. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? My dad has given me a lot of good pieces of advice, but in kind of the professional context, um, I ran a campaign, uh, for Congress for a guy named Sandy Lines, and he was a former CEO of a big fiber optic company. And he basically said, um, as a salesperson, you know, leave your job with the company before you go back on your word with a uh, uh, with a client or with a customer. And I was kind of took that with me. And that's I think that's important to maintaining relationships that that kind of commitment. That's nice. All right. Last thing. Who or what inspires you? Oh, who or what inspires me? Um, you know, probably is in the in the professional space probably politicians that go against the grain you know mm -hmm. republican or democrat otherwise but are willing to stand up and, and stake their political careers for what they believe mm -hmm. um, that i think professionally um and leisure the hunting public's probably my big bow hunter so and then yeah. probably in life my daughter so i don't know if you've ever got a three-prong answer to that i have not you'll be the first that's all good <laughs> Going back, going back to I'm an old guy, so I segment my life. I don't, you know. So. <laughs> That's there right. You go. You're allowed three. That's very good. Franklin, thanks so much for joining me today on this week's episode of Project HR. Glad to be here. Thanks. I also want to thank those listening in. Uh, here's a final reminder to unlock your access to this episode's companion guide at iriconsultants.com slash podcast. If you are ready for your Project HR debut, our team is always looking for outstanding guests. Let us know about your expertise at projecthr at iriconsultants.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to Project HR. A new episode posts every Thursday. Finally, drop me a line, leave us a review, or give the show a handful of stars wherever you get your content. On behalf of IRI Consultants, that's all for this week's episode of Project HR. Let's make it a great day at work.